Good afternoon and welcome to creating an environment for continuous compliance within open source software with Martin Collinan. Just a brief note about eSynergy before the presentation. eSynergy specializes in open source and cloud resourcing. If you are looking for a new opportunity or to build out your team, please get in touch after the webinar. Now, moving on to some housekeeping, if you have any questions for Martin, please fire them over via the questions box throughout and Martin will answer them at the end of his talk. We are recording the session and the slides and recording will be made available and sent to you tomorrow by email along with my contact details. Now, I'm going to pass over to Martin to begin the talk. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Martin Callinan. Uh, many thanks to eSynergy for hosting today's webinar. So what I'm going to focus on this afternoon is looking at business risks associated with open source software when it's used in software development. So I'm less focused on off-the-shelf packages uh, such as LibreOffice or even the Linux operating system, but really about custom software developments. So if you develop software in-house or supply solutions to end, end customers. Well, I suppose I've got two perspectives from this. I, I'm a member of Open UK, which is a UK industry association for open source software. And we focus on everything to do with open source software, uh, not just software developments, but uh, legal issues, things like DevOps uh, and anything to do with open data and open hardware. I also run a company called Source Code Control and we focus on helping co customers manage business risk in software developments. Now the general view of the open source community, very much the view in Open UK, is that open source as a development model has won. Uh, and what I mean by that is it is it's the proven de facto best best way to develop software. And a great example of this is the mobile industry, and there's some great quotes on the on this screen. If you think of what's happened with Android, where multiple different companies can build a solution around Android uh, and they can focus their R and D efforts on unique differentiators that make their handsets great, but not have to worry about managing the stack of what I would refer to as the plumbing of, of a mobile device. So it's not a, a differentiator to be able to answer a phone or send a text with, with a, a, a mobile phone. So why focus your resources on developing those, that, um, maintaining those features? And indeed, if you were to compare that to, say, Windows Mobile, where Microsoft managed the whole stack for Windows Mobile device, they're much slower and less agile in functionality to market and arguably that's one of the reasons why they have not been that successful in, in the mobile in the mobile space. Uh, also companies that you would not have thought of have been uh, receptive to open source like, like Microsoft I just mentioned now have fully dedicated open source teams and indeed Microsoft are one of the largest contributors to open source projects on GitHub. So as a development model it's definitely one. Uh, another example which the um, UK tech sector is very involved with uh, is the Internet of Things. Um, a, a recent survey by Vision Mobile, uh, the overall consensus 91% of software developers in the IoT space are electing to develop using open source technologies. And at the bottom, I, I've pulled out some quotes of some of the reasons developers are giving for contributing and using uh, open source software in their development. Uh, and the reason for putting out these quotes, you can see, um, so the first one, 55% of IoT developers cite ideology as a reason for using open source software. Now, I don't doubt for a minute the decision to use open source uh, for Internet of Things is the right decision. However, as we go into this presentation, I'm going to focus on some of the business risks and when you see the business risks, 
it, it's very clear that the, the outside of software developments, more senior managers in organizations need to play an active role in some of the decision processes around the adoption of open source in software developments. Now what is lagging far behind in the open source world is there's very little guidance for uh, business people or senior managers of software development teams or software developers themselves of how to effectively professionally manage open source software. Um, and now we've, we've been in dialogue with the British Standards Institute and we are going to start some work particularly around cyber security uh, uh, related to software development. But this is, this is one example. They, uh, British Standards Institute and Innovate UK recently published a code of practice for developing applications in the health sector. And out of a 25-page document, there's literally just one sentence which references potential risk of using open source components to build a health application. It doesn't give any guidance on what those implications might be or any strategies for how to manage, uh, manage those risks uh, with third party components. So I would, I would say two or three years lagging behind the adoption of open source from a technology perspective, uh, the business processes for managing open source is, is that far behind. So how does open source code enter a code base? Now, if you went back five, six years, there would be a, a clear differentiation between proprietary solutions and open source solutions. So if an application was developed to run on Linux, it pretty much is going to be a 100% open source solution. Now, uh, developers can download components for things like .NET, uh, Windows, uh, multiple different operating systems. And, and you can go onto public sites like GitHub uh, and, and download code. You can reuse code that's already been developed. Uh, maybe you contract in some outsourced software development and you can reuse that code. So all those components ultimately get put together with some custom code and you get a final, final solution. The challenge from a business risk perspective is each one of those components carries potentially a risk. First of all, it will have a, a license associated with it, uh, and there are over 2,400 different types of open source licenses, each with different business implications to an organization. Uh, also, there are security vulnerabilities and known security vulnerabilities which could be within some of these components. So the potential for a business is to actually engineering risk into a solution that they deliver to their clients uh, and if they get exploited then there are potential legal issues and other ramifications associated with passing on those risks. Now I mentioned the Internet of Things, so a, a good example of a supply chain risk with these components is in a typical IoT device. First of all there will be a physical piece of hardware. Or, or multiple pieces of physical hardware, uh, so things like Raspberry Pi type uh, circuit boards. Uh, th th there, is a, there is a hardware issue with Internet of Things where the, 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 there are counterfeit components which, um, first of all, they probably will not be as reliable as, as proprietary components. Uh, but also when it comes to having a processor with an operating system, the operating system could have components added to the operating system which could be malware or it could be components that are on the operating system that are just not needed for your solution. So uh, first of all you should be mindful of what operating system and components are being delivered with that hardware. But then using the example I gave previously about all these components, you build your solution and it goes onto that operating system and starts interacting with those hardware devices and that then ships to uh, end customers. So you potentially, if you don't have a strategy for managing the security risks, the IP risks, you could be passing those risks on to potentially thousands of end users. And if those end users get exploited or there's legal issues, intellectual property issues, that could come back 
through that supply chain and you could face um, serious issues around, uh, which we're going to talk about later, around insurance, uh, intellectual property and issues around security vulnerabilities. So I'm going to focus on what are the security risks that you find in open source software. Uh, one of the best sources for finding out about uh, vulnerabilities is the National Vulnerability Database. There are other sources, but generally the National Vulnerability Database is a good place to start. In 2015, there were, there were 4,300 open source vulnerabilities posted on the National Vulnerability Database. One of the most high profile vulnerabilities, and it's probably the first high profile open source vulnerability was uh, called Harbleed, uh, and so it's the logo on the, on the right hand side at the top. So Harbleed was um, a vulnerability in a project, an open source project called OpenSSL, and it impacted multiple secure websites around, around the world. Now the challenge, if, if you've got no way of tracking, so no formal process of tracking components that are in your solution, so the components that software developers are putting together to build a solution and there is a vulnerability, then you would have no way of knowing that vulnerability is sitting in your software. And if you've delivered a solution, it could be the firmware of an IoT device, for instance, uh, or other software solution, then you unwittingly could be passing on a vulnerability where one of your customers gets exploited. So that's clearly a, a, a business risk that you need to be aware of. Also, with Harbleed, uh, Harbleed got loads of press, but since Harbleed, there's been over 49 further vulnerabilities that have been posted on the National Vulnerability Database related with that same project. So OpenSSL has continually had vulnerabilities, and that is not unique to OpenSSL. That is, that is fairly common across multiple open source projects. And it will be the same situation with proprietary projects, but with open source, being uh, where source code is open, it's very easy to see where these vulnerabilities are. So the point about the fact there are further vulnerabilities since Harbleed, it's not just a case of every now and then you should audit your code and find if you've got vulnerabilities. It's a continual process to keep monitoring code for vulnerabilities and perhaps be managing and risk managing, uh, fixing those vulnerabilities so your customers are safe. And that leads on to a conundrum for a lot of organizations at different levels. So if you're, if you're a software developer, um, you, you got, you've got pressure of meeting uh, high pressure deadlines. Uh, it could be uh, have m multiple deadlines on a project. Uh, you don't want to have the reputation of uh, supplying insecure software. And also if the, the business you work for has no strategy for controlling what components you use. If, you, if you've got a technical challenge and you find a piece of software that you could leverage that will help you address that challenge, you will use that piece of software. And, and like I said, if there's no policy that says you cannot do that, then you're, you're fine in, in your methodology for doing that. So there's a developer dilemma and then there's the business dilemma. The business dilemma is fairly similar where you might have commitments to customers, commitments to partners, or commitments internally to deliver software solutions to a, a defined product roadmap. Uh, and therefore, you, you don't want to put any, any barriers in place that might delay the delivery of, of, of those release cycles. So what we, what we tend to find is customers try to not, not deliberately, but they will underinvest in security solutions because they fear it will delay release cycles. So they don't want to disturb software development. And if anything, they will fix issues after the event, uh, which may not be the best strategy. Now, a, a typical source code scenario, um, this is a piece of code which I recently just went on to GitHub and I found some repositories of uh, well-known organizations, and I just did a, a, a quick security scan of all the components. And this is typically what we find when we first do a review with a potential client, is within their source code, and this source code could be delivered 
train customers. There will be multiple vulnerabilities in components of varying levels of severity. So you see on this example, the most severe vulnerabilities are rated at 7.5. Um, but like I said, this is not an uncommon scenario. Now, this, this code may not be the final code that is being delivered to a, a client. But if you have a strategy or not a clear strategy about what you allow software development to share in the public domain, so this is from a, a repository in the public domain. If a, another organization or developer working for an organization was to take your code and embed it in their code, and it's got these vulnerabilities, then you've now got a supply chain of organizations and developers using code with known vulnerabilities. So then if they then pass on their solution to customers, and those customers get exploited, it could be working backwards, where did the source and provenance of this code come from? It actually came from a repository in your company name, and therefore you potentially could face a legal challenge based on your lack of ability to control what's in the public domain from a security perspective. So uh, I'll give some examples of how these issues are manifesting themselves in the real world. Uh, the first one, uh, which you probably aware of earlier in the year, became known as the Panama Papers. So this embroiled David Cameron and his late father. Uh, there's an organization, an investment organization in the Bahamas who uh, were exploited and uh, data was breached about all the investors in this, in this fund. Now, the vulnerabilities that were exploited were open source vulnerabilities. So there's 25 vulnerabilities found. Those vulnerabilities at the time of the exploit all had fixes for them. Uh, the most prominent vulnerability became known as uh, Drown, uh, and that was what ex was exploited. So it's exploiting SSL v2 protocol, and the data was exploited. Now, I suspect that uh, the organization Mossack Fonseca would not have developed that portal themselves. They probably would have contracted in software developments, but they probably didn't have a strategy for defining to their supplier what are the SLAs for managing security vulnerabilities and a clear strategy to ensure that their portal is always up to date. So that was a, a data breach. But now, uh, software is finding its way into every part of our life. So if you went back to 1995, an F-22 Raptor had 1.7 million lines of code. A modern day car, so a Mercedes S Class 2015, had 100 million lines of code. A lot of that code was um, open source software. And the reality of, open, of, of coding cars is, is cars are now getting hacked and exploited. There was uh, some famous in the US breaches of uh, the Jeep Cherokee, uh, where the cars were steered off the highway, and that's to do a recall on the cars. And there was a recent article only only uh, only last week, ZDNet, stating that uh, in 2017, uh, if you've got a relatively new car, you should expect a recall on the car because of security vulnerabilities in open source software. Uh, but it's not unique just to the car industry. Now I want to talk about uh, risks associated with licensing and intellectual property. Uh, not only is the risk uh, purely about license compliance, but I'll also give some examples of how open source software licensing obligations can in themselves become a security risk. So uh, for those of you not familiar with open source licensing, there are multiple different types of open source licensing. So you just can't say open source software is open source software. Uh, so at the sim simpler end, there's a, 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 a bunch of licenses which are generally termed permissive licenses. And there are obligations with permissive licenses, such as you have to post license notices in your software that you're using components licensed in a certain way. Uh, but to all intents and purposes, you can choose 
what you do with that component in a piece of software that you're developing. So there is no requirement on you to share your source code or your intellectual property if you use those components. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got these um, restrictive licenses, which are sometimes referred to as copyleft licenses. And they, they refer to as copyleft because basic, basically um, the, the companies behind these licenses are using copyright law to enforce that license model onto, onto anybody who uses the software. So it's called copyleft or reciprocal. And the most prominent copyleft license is the GPL, the general public license, which is the license model for the Linux kernel. Now, the, the, key, the key thing that makes it restrictive and makes it potentially a, a risk for some organizations is the obligation that you have to license your code under the same license terms. So even if you use one component of GPL licensed software uh, in, a, in a piece of software with a thousand components, you have to adopt the GPL license model. And the, the further obligation is that you have to share your source code with anybody who uh, requests access to the source code, or you have to uh, inform people where they can download that source code for that software. Now, if your intellectual property and your USP of your organization is built around your software, then potentially sharing your source code uh, could be revealing something like trade secrets. Uh, it could be re revealing what's unique about your organization. So copyleft licenses become a big risk, both intellectual property-wise and, as I'll show you, potentially security-wise. A further type of license, which has gained prominence in, in recent times, is referred to as open, open core. Now, this is a kind of a, a dual licensing strategy where a software company will release a, a basic version of their software solution as open source software. Uh, you'll be able to view the source code. You'll be able to modify the source code. But then they have a further level of functionality, which arguably would be the most valuable functionality. And they would license that in a different way under a more proprietary type license. So you can't see the source code. Uh, it's it's a, a pay to use type model. And that's caused a lot of contention in the open source world. It's debated heavily within Open UK. Uh, so an example would be um, an ERP what was marketed as an open source ERP system called Odoo. Uh, so they've got this um, dual licensing model where there is a basic version which might be adequate for maybe a, a small medium business, uh, but if you want to adopt that in an enterprise, you probably want to access the more enterprise features and they will be licensed under a proprietary type, type model. So uh, although they're marketing as open source solutions, uh, it's questionable whether that is actually true to say it's open source. So how do these issues uh, manifest themselves in reality? So I'm going to tell a story from earlier this year, um, and the, the dates, the January 18th is uh, significant to the story. There's a, an organization called JIDE who are, have released an operating system called Remix Operating System, which is based on Android. And the idea is it's a low footprint operating system that can breathe life into old, uh, old legacy hardware. So they started their marketing campaign pre-launch on January 18th about how great their operating system uh, is. And on their public forum, some software developers started requesting a copy of the source code, uh, believing it to be open source. And uh, in the public domain, uh, the support representatives for JIDE stated that the operating system is not open source. Therefore, unless you are a partner of JIDE, then you cannot have a copy of the source code. However, if you install the software, uh, which you could do under the beta, there is clear reference to the GPL license, so one of these copyleft licenses I referred to earlier. And as I, as I stated, the obligation of using one component of GPL 
code in your solution is you have to make your source code available to anybody who requests it. So um, there started to be a bit of noise on the internet. Uh, some journalists got hold of the story and started posting stories such as this one in InfoWorld. Uh, did Remix operating system violate the GPL and Apache licenses? Now clearly, uh, that sort of press pre-launched to a new piece of software which hasn't been launched before. Uh, the company's probably got investors. Uh, the last thing you want is press stating things like violation of a license because of future risk. So literally two days later, there was a press release uh, from JIDE stating that they uh, take their responsibilities seriously for open source and they are now compliant with the GPL, i.e. they are now sharing the source code for their solution. Now it may well be that they had no issues sharing their source code, uh, but it seems on the surface of it that their business strategy was not to share their source code, however due to pressure from the negative press they were getting they decided to share their source code. Uh, to be compliant with the GPL. Uh, so uh, you can think of multiple scenarios where where that might be an issue for an organization and potentially could devalue uh, a, a solution that a company is bringing to market. Another example, going back to the auto industry, is with BMW. So anybody who's got a BMW i3, if you browse through the media player, you'll find one of these open source license notices uh, if you browse through the settings. And there's clear reference there to, again, the GPL, which is one of these copyleft licenses. And it does state uh, you can get a copy of the source code. So a developer in Australia, a guy called Terence Seedon, you can research him on the internet, uh, he went into a BMW dealership and requested the source code for that part of his car. And of course, he got he got black looks from uh, car salespeople within the dealership. Um, however, ultimately, uh, BMW did ship him a copy of the source code. Uh, he did an analysis of the source code, um, and it contained components by Wind River, Autosar, etc., etc. Now, he subsequently has uploaded uh, that source code to GitHub. So, if you search on GitHub for Chen Seedon, you'll see this source code. Now, uh, BMW seemed to have a strategy because they said they were making the source code available. If where it becomes a security risk as well as a license compliance risk is if you were forced to comply uh, by a legal notice to share the source code and your legal counsel advised you to share the source code, uh, then you would have very little time potentially to go through the source code looking for things like security vulnerabilities, maybe bad coding practice, uh, maybe uh, comments that may be derogatory, all sorts of different issues. But primarily, you could re release some source code with security vulnerabilities, which then would expose your clients to being exploited. So obviously, what's, what was on the surface of it, a license compliance intellectual property issue has now become also a potential security issue for an organization. Uh, another uh, recent uh, enforcement case that's been going on in Germany um, was between a Linux kernel developer called Helwig uh, who, who challenged VMware who he believed were using some of his code licensed under the GPL and were not sharing uh, their source code back to uh, the community so they could benefit from their their advances. Now, the uh, anybody who's heard of the software Freedom Conservancy, they're related to, um, they're, they're basically, they, they fund developers to take legal action or to deal with a legal situation where they feel like their software is being abused by particularly large, large corporates. It's actually crowdfunded and supported uh, this legal case in, in Germany. It's been going on since 2007. The first thing they tried to do is to uh, negotiate uh, a, a settlement where the source code is settled without going to court. Uh, the Software Freedoms Conservancy in no way 
trying to profit from these sorts of situations. All they're trying to do is to maintain the ethos of open source software. Um, now this, this case has been going on for some time. It's been through various levels of court in Germany. Uh, the current situation is that VMware have won the case and it's been kicked out. However, it has been, um, it, it's going back to court again in the, in the future as, uh, as that decision is going to be, be challenged. But either way, obviously VMware are a big software organization with deep pockets and can sustain a legal challenge like that. Uh, if you're a, a, a small to medium tech company uh, bringing a solution to market, uh, dealing with one of those challenges could be quite expensive for you as, uh, as an organization. So it becomes a serious, serious issue. Now, uh, because, of, because, of the, um, because of the adoption of open source, uh, we talked about at the beginning how, how prevalent open source has become. What, what follows in the wake of it is an increase in uh, people trying to make money out of the situation and challenge organizations. So in, in, in Europe, I've, I've pulled out some examples in Europe, it's happening uh, a lot in the US as well, is um, uh, similar to the Hellwig case, uh, other than it's about monetary gain. A guy called Patrick McCarty, who was a Linux kernel developer, uh, has now started challenging organizations. He's targeting larger organizations who he knows are, are not complying with the GPL, so using code he's been involved with. And he knows in these organizations there are mul multiple violations and compliance issues. And his strategy is to target one compliance issue, go to an organization and agree a monetary settlement and an, an agreement that they will comply going forward. Uh, what the organizations aren't aware of is that there are also other compliance issues that are being uh, brought forward at that point in time. So when the settlement is made, he will then return to the same organizations and, and talk about the other violations. And again, he will seek monetary gain. So he's referred to as a, an IP troll, and he's very much been outcast from the Linux kernel community. Uh, but apparently he has made significant cash settlements in uh, German courts. Similarly, uh, there's a guy called Harold Welt, who actually runs a compliance company, and uh, he actively enforces the GPL across Europe. He's brought civil charges in Germany. He issues cease and desist notices and damages for lost revenue. Now, both, both these types of organizations, they do tend to target larger organizations, but what I would say is because of the broad adoption of open source, these types of scenarios are going to increase. This, this, uh, there's also issues around patent trolling, so there's lots of patent issues with open source software as well. So I suppose my, my point is that there is an increased need to have a strategy for managing licensing uh, if you are developing using open source software. So I'm going to talk now about what are the simple strategies, not simple strategies, but the principles for putting in a process for managing risk in open source software in, in development. So on the, on the screen you see a very simple DevOps process where you've got developers uh, building, integrating, and there's continuous testing, continuous delivery, and you deliver, deliver, deliver a solution. And I'll put the, um, the Puppet logo, so Puppet being a, a DevOps tool, I've included the Puppet logo because I attended a Puppet user group meeting uh, this year, and the feedback from uh, Puppet professionals, or puppeteers as they are referred to in the Puppet world, is that they are never tasked with any issues or management of uh, intellectual property or licensing uh, or security vulnerabilities and indeed they believe security vulnerabilities to be somebody else's problem. So the pressure as we talked about on developers and DevOps to deliver solutions is, is driving the behavior within that continuous delivery type scenario. Now 
should you audit your code? So there are tools where you can audit code and pick up some of these vulnerabilities. Uh, and there are multiple industry stats about the cost of remediation of any issue within code the further down the release cycle you go. So if you've already released software, it's going to be way more expensive to remediate that issue, uh, rebuild the software, go through our test cycle again, and then release to end customers. So clearly, the best strategy would be not to audit at the end, but to audit all the way through the process, and I'll, I'll, I will come on to that. So reactive, although is some form of a solution, is probably not the best solution. And from personal experience, if companies do anything, they will do a code review at the end, uh, and they will look at things like copyright notices and security, and if there's issues, send it back to development. Uh, that, that is a very reactive way of dealing with things, and as from those industry stats, will be more, 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 more expensive, more time consuming, and more disruptive to uh, further release cycles. But what the strategy needs to be is, um, and most companies uh, that we deal with initially do not have this in place, is what, what is your open source policy? So as, a, as an organization, not as, a, not as an individual developer, but as an organization, what is your strategy with open source software? Are you committed to open source software? Do you want to share your, your code to uh, other organizations? Do you need to keep your source code closed, even though you're leveraging open source? So you need to define what, what, what is your policy for using open source software and software development? Who needs to be involved in the management of it? Do you have in-house legal, third-party legal? Uh, you will have a product management team. You will no doubt have a security team, and obviously software development and R&D. But who ultimately is responsible who's responsible for different elements, like the licensing, like the security, and how does it all come together, and what is covered, and how do you communicate that out to your software development team uh, and when you onboard new employees. So fundamental to being successful in risk managing open source software is to have a clearly defined open source policy, and that policy will be a dynamic policy and it needs to change with the evolution of what's happening in the open source world and what's happening with your software developments. So what an open source solution might look like if you've got that policy in place, and uh, in this example, you're going to share your source code with the community on GitHub, is with your clearly defined open source policy, which defines your licensing strategy, your security, uh, service level agreements, so you've got this overall policy which everybody's aware of, and you've got software developers uh, building software and building libraries which are being shared on somewhere like GitHub. What a good policy would be is whoever the management stakeholders are in the project, they get regular reports on the source code which is being used by customers of any risk, either IP risk or security risk, uh, so they can be track and be aware of any potential issues that might come up, up, up in the future. So for instance, if I was to go back to the Panama Papers, uh, so the worst case scenario is you've got security vulnerability and you've been exploited, but really if the management team were fully aware of that at the beginning, at least they could do damage limit, limitation proactively and deal with the, the fallout of that situation. So reporting going into management, no detail about software, but just a high-level report about any, any known security vulnerabilities, how long it's going to take to fix those vulnerabilities. So there should be a service level agreement in the policy that states, for instance, if you've got a vulnerability over severity 8, then it will take 48 hours to provide a fix to end customers. And then on the next report, you can track whether that actually happened or, or not. But for every release of software, you can release a report, which generally is termed a, a bill of materials, which itemizes all the third-party components and the in-house developed components that you've uh, 
you put into a solution and there's complete transparency with end customers, there's transparency with the community, and there's transparency with management about any issues in that in that code or arguably there shouldn't be any issues in the code in the first place. So then when you get to what I termed uh, the title of this presentation, continuous compliance, the best and most cost effective strategy is to be monitoring co components of code being used in software development all the way through the software development life cycle. So from the first build, an individual developer is aware of the open source policy. So if he's looking for a third party piece of software to address a technical challenge, he knows what license type he can use and he knows what the licensing strategy is around that. So hopefully, proactively, that person will not engineering risk into his part of the solution or her part of the solution. And then as it gets integrated, you can test again. Uh, as it goes through testing, you can review the code again. So when it comes to the final build, the final build analysis of looking for security vulnerabilities and looking for IP issues should be pretty much a tick box in exercise. And you shouldn't have to send any application back to development unless there was a security vulnerability that was announced very late in, 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 in the build cycle. So, so this is just a very simplistic view of what you can uh, put in as a solution. Obviously, the devil is in the detail and it's not necessarily straightforward to do that. And you'll go through stages of maturity if you've never done that sort of thing before. Now, I just want to finish off on where we see the business impact uh, to organizations uh, both today and moving forward. What we're seeing is a level of maturity in corporate procurements when they are procuring a solution which is based on open source software. So basically they're, they're, get, they're getting smarter to some of these risks and uh, are looking for demonstration of uh, software suppliers or solution providers have got a strategy for managing professionally the open source software being used to build the solution. Now, uh, a term that's started to be, be being used is this term professional reusable software over just free software. So free software is software you can obviously freely download, but there could be a security vulnerability, there might be a clear licensing strategy. But if you're, if you're an IT procurement person uh, and you want to measure the, I say the quality, but the structure for managing that software, then you'll be looking for things like what is the open source software policy or software policy overall, what is the service level agreements for dealing with security vulnerabilities, can the supplier demonstrate that they can uh, scan their code for, for third party components. So, so we're seeing this happening in IT procurement today. So software companies, so any software companies on this call will find more and more challenges in things like RFPs to be able to demonstrate these things. Another, another thing which is, another area which is um, becoming very prevalent is in the insurance industry. Uh, and I'll put up cyber insurance, but it also includes IP insurance as well. So we're seeing a trend in the insurance industry. We've been asked to get involved in some of these scenarios uh, where an insurer uh, or an organization looking for insurance against um, who develop software, insurers are looking to measure the effectiveness of that techni technical organization to, again, to demonstrate that they are effectively managing risk in that software which they are passing on to their clients. And they are setting premium rates based on the ability of companies to be able to demonstrate that. And I'll give you a perfect example. I'll give you a perfect example from the past two weeks where um, a, a UK software company has sold a solution to a UK company who then got acquired by a US company and the legal counsel from the US company said that the UK software company needs to indemnify them 
against intellectual property risk of any third party software they've used in their solution. Uh, so uh, they have no way of doing that, so that's to buy a service to do that. But we're seeing an increase in those sorts of challenges. So the better you are at being able to demonstrate you have control over the things we talked about in this webinar, uh, the better. Something that's been around for some time, uh, the VC venture capital market, where tech companies, there's a lot of investment going into UK tech companies. Generally, part of a due diligence process, definitely if it's a second round funding or, or later, is what risks are there in the software that's being developed. And I can tell you a lot, a lot, a lot of investors get very nervous about things like the GPL license uh, because they feel uh, you may end up sharing uh, things like trade secrets or something that's unique in your software which might devalue their investments when they exit in the future. And related to that is another thing that's fairly new. There's been some laws passed recently both in the US and in the European Union about uh, mandating that organizations need to manage trade secrets. Now a trade secret could be anything. So a trade secret, for instance, for Coca-Cola would be uh, their, their formula for Coke, which has this, apparently has this hidden ingredient. That will be a trade secret. Now, uh, where, where does that fit in with open source software? Well, if you can't manage the security around a solution, and a company or an in-house piece of software is exploited and a trade secret is exposed, then there are legal there are now legal ramifications for that. So again, the business risk for managing security or even being forced to share your source code could reveal a trade secret which has a knock-on impact that it might be a, a legal situation. So I just wanted to raise some of the some of the business areas we're, we're, we're finding are coming into place. So to, just to finish up, some, some resources you might have a look at. I mentioned I'm involved with the uh, Open UK. Uh, we've, we've evolved out of uh, the Open Source Consortium, uh, so there's not a great deal of content on our current website, but if you, if you keep tracking, there'll be new content, coming, a new website coming very soon. Uh, Open, Open Forum Europe is a UK-based but European-wide organization that advises government on all things open. So get involved in open source software, open standards, open data, open hardware. So there's quite a lot of resources on their website which you might be interested in. The Free Software Foundation has a European subsidiary. Uh, again, they have content on their website which is useful for European organizations. We have content on our website. So we've got uh, various blogs around some of the situations that have been covered on this webinar. And uh, a, a publication that we did for Open UK, which was aimed at public sector, uh, but it was, it was talking about this uh, principle of professional reusable software. Now, the, the principles we talk about, although this was focused on public sector because it was for a public sector show that was being hosted in, in London, the principles that are talked about are relevant to any size organization. And it's also relevant to whether you're a company supplying a solution to end customer or an end customer looking to adopt a solution. And that is a free download from Open UK's website. Uh, I, I'll put the link there, but you can just browse to the media library on Open UK and you can, uh, you can just download that as a PDF. Uh, if you did want a physical copy, uh, then you can feel free to contact me. So that was a very, very high level view of business risk in open source software and, and some of the ideas and strategies that you can use to, to manage those. And as I said, the devil is in the, in the detail. So I'm just going to see if we've got any questions from uh, attendees. Just bear with me a couple of, couple of minutes. So we have two, two, two questions which are kind of related. Uh, so the first question is, where where would where would an organisation start if they if they didn't believe they were managing this or weren't sure if they were managing this? So where I would start is first of all do your own basic risk assessments and 
organize a source code review and see what third party components software developers have used and whether you would have a risk with those those components based on the type of business you you are so I suppose you can't manage what you cannot see uh, and then the, the other question was re was related to uh, technologies for helping with this situation so are there any tools on the market for uh, putting in this information so there are a number of uh, code scanning tools that are are hundred percent focused on managing business risk so uh, some of the some of the big players there's a uh, Palameda, who recently got acquired by a company called Flexera. Uh, there's a company called Black Dog Software, who have a solution for scanning software. Now, one caveat I would say is, if you do a scan with one of these technologies, they tend to highlight particularly license risk, uh, and they will flag GPL as a license risk. Now, the GPL may not be a license risk to your organization if you're comfortable sharing your source code. So um, what I would say is the devil is in the interpretation of the data these tools uh, pull out. But a, a good starting point would be uh, some, of these, some of these companies offer a free uh, scan of a segment of, of code. It would just give you an idea of just based on a, a percentage of a, a source code repository, what sort of components have been used that you wouldn't have been aware of as a business and whether that might be a risk to you. So I don't believe we've got any more questions. So I will thank you for your time. Um, I hope that was informative. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to go back through e-resourcing. I'm sure they can uh, they can uh, uh, they can get the information you need. Thank you.